Um, I'm going to introduce our next keynote speaker right now. She comes to us from Los Angeles, California, and she had to take the red eye to get here due to our unjust system, but she can tell you about that. Dr. Melina Abdullah is a professor and chair of Pan-African Studies at California State University. She earned her PhD from the University of Southern California in political science and her bachelor's from Howard University in African American Studies. She is a recognized expert on race, gender, class, and social movements. Melina is the author of numerous articles and book chapters with subjects ranging from political coalition building to womanist mothering. She was among the original group of organizers that convened to form Black Lives Matter and continues to serve as a Los Angeles chapter lead and contributes to the global leadership. She is the co-host and co-producer of the weekly radio program, Beautiful Struggle, which airs on KPFK and hosts and produces the weekly internet radio show, Move the Crowd, which airs on Radio Justice. Melina is the recipient of many awards and was recognized by LA Weekly as one of the 10 most influential Los Angeles leaders, Urban Girl of the Year, and one of the 15 fiercest sisters of 2015 by Fierce. She has appeared on MSNBC, CNN, TV One, ABC, PBS, Revolt TV, BET, Free Speech TV, and Al Jazeera, and is featured in the films 13, When Justice Isn't Just, and Justice or Else, and the television series Two Sides. Melina is originally from Oakland, California. She is... <laughs> okay, there's two of you in the room. She is a single soccer mom of three children and resides in mid-city Los Angeles. And even though Melina had never heard of the community rights movement before we reached out to her, her message resonated with us. Her message is one of rights, repression, and resistance, and of shifting power. So you can see what the attraction was and the connection, the commonality to community rights. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Melina Abdullah. for having me and Tish walked out to get me some water but um, I'm very thankful for the very deliberate way this conference was put together we spent a lot of time talking and prepping usually I just kind of come in and speak or listen or participate and then go but just kind of having um, had an opportunity to have conversations ahead that meant a lot and it helped to kind of ground me into this so Tish asked for um, asked for a title to my talk. I guess this was back in, I don't know, what was it, like months ago, six months ago or so. And I sent it in, and it was um, uh, The Audacity of Blackness, um, Rights, Repression, and Resistance. And at the time, I didn't plan to be the case study, right? It was supposed to be <laughs> a kind of conceptual discussion around Black Lives Matter and kind of the work that we've been doing over the last five years. And then in May, I was arrested, which isn't like abnormal, right? I, I've, <laughs> um, I've been arrested six times now um, doing Black Lives Matter work. Look, you know you're with organizers when you get applause for that, right? <laughs> so, uh, no, don't. It's not a good use of time, right? <laughs> Although sometimes I think about Dr. King was arrested 40 times, and I think, ah, I'm just stu getting started, right? Six, still single digits, right? Um, um, so I was arrested in May. And some of you may have paid attention. Um, hopefully you heard about what happened on May 8th inside the meeting of the Los Angeles Police Commission. Um, we've been working with a family. So just for context, you should know that LAPD kills more people than any other law enforcement unit in the nation by far, 
right? So even if you think about it in terms of population size, LAPD kills more than double the number of NYPD with a population that's half the size, right? And so we need to understand that, so we are regularly involved. It's the reason that Black Lives Matter was birthed in Los Angeles is because we face so much in terms of police violence in LA. Um, what LA is good at is because what else is LA home to? Hollywood. They're very good at the PR spin. So you don't hear the names the same way you hear names of people who were killed in other cities. But it's there, the impact is there, and it's really important that we organize. And so we've been attending police commission meetings to kind of give a voice to the community for the last four years. And over the last two years, one of the names that, so when we go to police commission meetings, we speak the names of the people who've been killed, right? Um, and just for clarity, we need to know that Black Lives Matter is not simply a social justice movement, right? We're not simply a racial justice movement. We recognize that the work that we do is spiritual work. And I don't know where you all are in terms of spirituality, but it took, I don't know why it took us so long, about a year into Black Lives Matter, um, a brother named Ezell Ford was killed in Los Angeles. And he's featured in that television series, Two Sides. Um, but Ezell Ford um, had recently been killed and we were pushing for justice for him. And there was a moment when we realized that although we go and speak the names of the people who've been killed, we didn't fully understand what it meant to speak their names, right? So literally when we come out, um, we try to come out within the first couple of hours of someone being killed. As soon as we hear, we go out and we have a presence in the community. Sometimes we're literally standing on their blood, literally. And so to ignore the spirituality of it is to pretend like we're not doing something that we're actually doing, right? And so we struggle for justice in their names and by calling their names. And so just so that you know, in African tradition, when we call people's names, when we pour libation, you're actually summoning their spirits into that space. You're refusing to let them die, right? Um, their bodies are gone, but we believe in the um, endurance of the spirit, right? And so we go and we go to places that are hostile, like police commission meetings, and we call the names of our people. And one of the names we've been calling with regularity for the last two years, two and a half years now, is Waukesha Wilson. And I hope that you've heard her story. Um, Waukesha Wilson was a mother, and she was arrested on a Friday, the Friday before Easter Sunday, and um, very minor incident. She was accused of having a uh, altercation, minor altercation with somebody and was arrested. And um, she calls her mom, and like most black people, it's not their family's first run in with police, right? And she's also very working class, not a lot of money. And she said to her mom, don't bail me out will go to my hearing, and I'll get out on OR. It's some, a BS charge, and it's a minor charge. And told her mother that, and that was that, right? Less than an hour later, the story is that her, the, the story that the police tell is that her body was discovered in her jail cell. Now, what we know is their story is a lie, because what they claim is that Waukesha Wilson, this mother who just spoken to her mother less than an hour before her body is discovered, right? They're alleging that she hung herself from a phone booth that sits less than two feet off the floor with a cord that's less than 11 inches long. Now, I was booked into that same jail many times now, and we measured it, right? It's physically impossible for that story to be true. Not only that, there's surveillance video. Um, it's kind of a newer detention center. It was built maybe 10, 15 years ago. All of the cells are monitored. Mysteriously, it's missing 22 minutes of the video. So the video cuts off 
22 minutes missing, and then it starts back up. And they say, we don't know what happened to it. So we've been going with her family, her mother and her aunt, right? Co-raised her, and they've been coming and part of Black Lives Matter really since her death. And this is kind of, in my view, how spirit works, right? Um, when Waukesha Wilson was killed, I'm also, I, I have a real job just so that you know that Black Lives Matter, we're not paid to do this work, right? Although they, you know, the right likes to call us paid organizers. And I don't believe that there's anything wrong with being a paid organizer, if you are, right? Martin Luther King was a paid organizer, right? Um, so it's important that we push back against that, but in Black Lives Matter, we're not paid organizers. We do this work because we believe it's our sacred duty to do this work. So we're paid doing other things. So I'm paid to be a college professor. And I teach in Pan-African Studies. And I had the student in my class named Brittany Quiet. She won't mind me saying her name, right? And Brittany, um, we kind of pulled her in through general education classes. She started taking Pan-African Studies as a requirement and then wound up becoming a minor. Um, because she didn't discover us till her junior year, but we became fairly close. She had this internal tension because she also worked for the probation department and actually worked inside of one of the juvenile halls. And she would, we talk about, you know, the problems with the system and she would kind of feel tense about it because she felt torn, right? Just after she finished my winter class, she came to me, I get a frantic phone call from Brittany, and she said, my cousin was killed inside the jail. Waukesha Wilson was her cousin. So immediately, we were connected with her mom and her aunt and began doing work um, as soon as her mother discovers Waukesha's death. So let me just kind of walk through that murder. Waukesha, they're alleging that Waukesha Wilson killed herself, right? We know that they're lying. To add um, to the horror of the story, she was supposed to be arraigned on Tuesday. So she's arrested Friday. Anybody who knows anything knows it's the worst day to get arrested because then you sit in jail all weekend and your case doesn't get before a judge until Monday at the earliest, but usually Tuesday. So she was set to be arraigned on Tuesday so the mom, she's killed on Sunday, though. The mom goes to the Tuesday arraignment. She's never notified. She sits in court from 8.30 in the morning till court closes at 4.30. She's asking the bailiff, where is my daughter? She's supposed to be arraigned. Why is she not on the list? The bailiff notices that her name is struck through on the list, but says, oh, she might be coming in the late transports. She never shows up. So Lisa Hines, Waukesha's mom, winds up leaving and then frantically calling the jail. She's not connected with anyone. People keep giving her the runaround. Finally, many hours later, she calls and speaks to the watch commander of the jail. And he says, here, try this number. And she calls, and it's the coroner's office. No one even bothered to tell her that her daughter was dead. I want you to process that. When we're arrested, the first thing they do is take our information. They take our emergency contact. They knew how to get in touch with her mother. They didn't even bother to treat Waukesha like they would treat a dog that was hit by a car in the street that had tags on it. If a dog was hit by a car, they would immediately contact its owner. They didn't even bother to tell this mother. And then for two years, the family has been criminalized for lifting up Waukesha's name. So for two years, we've been going to police commission meeting, and we've been saying, say her name, and we chant back, Waukesha Wilson, let's do that here. Let's summon her into that space. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. And we've been doing that work, doing it in protests outside of the jail, doing it at protests inside the jail, 
doing it at police commission meetings, doing it at gatherings, doing it for her birthday and for Mother's Day, doing it for her son's 14th birthday and 15th birthday, right? And so in May, we discover after the family finally reaches a settlement with the city, which was a terrible settlement that gave almost no money to support her now, her son who now has no mother to raise him, right? Less than $100,000 given to the family, right? Through an investigative journalist, we discover that the officer who was supposed to be charged with watching Waukesha had been fired for misconduct. There was a cover-up over that firing, so that couldn't be used in the civil case to get a bigger award for the family. So how would you feel if you were the mother or if you were the aunt who also helped to raise her? You'd be enraged. So on May 8th, we walk into the police commission meeting and none of the Black Lives Matter organizers knew what was gonna happen. I was late, so I really didn't know what was gonna happen. But the aunt of Waukesha Wilson, who is a phenomenal, powerful, spirit-filled sister named Sheila Hines Brim, um, the way it's set up, the police commission sits on this dais, all the public has to sit in the audience, and the police commission sits on this dais, and they sit next to the police chief and um, uh, the, the uh, city attorney representative and um, some other city folks, right, city officials. So the police chief is sitting there. This is Charlie Beck, who we finally ran out of office, right, but who oversaw both the murder of Waukesha Wilson and then the ruling of the police commission that her murder was in policy, right? They just discovered the cover-up. The aunt of Waukesha Wilson, um, allegedly, although she says she did it, right, gets up and I had just walked in the door, didn't even see it happen till I, to later when I saw the videotape, gets up and throws the cremated ashes of her niece in the face of the police chief. That's right. And yells, that's Waukesha, right? Mm. So I was like, that was a, you know, now I'm going, that's a little bit of spiritual justice if you can't get no other kind of justice, right? I'm sure he's thinking about her in his dreams at night, right? She's visiting him, right? Um, so I'm walking in and I don't see what, I didn't see what happened. All I see is the police and the attorneys are gonna be mad at me for sharing this, but the police manhandling Sheila Hines and pulling her out the room. And I'm distracted by some commotion that other organizers are calling or causing, but I, I see Sheila Hines being manhandled, and that doesn't normally happen to the families, right? Um, we, we usually form a circle around them. We don't let the police touch them or even get close to them, but they're manhandling Sheila Hines, and I'm nervous about it, and I'm deciding, okay, the only protection we have is really kind of our phones. Let me at least get it out on social media, what they're doing to this family, right, after everything else they've done. And so I'm trying to record and then I'm yelling at the police, that's the auntie, that's the family. You saw some of it, I think, on video, right? And it's kind of calm for me the way I, I'm not cussing at them, right? And in the midst of it all, they pull her out the room and we get out the room to make sure she's okay. And one of the cops yells, grab Melina. And so I'm arrested. And I'm thinking, this won't be anything, right? But why are they arresting me? So I'm going, what, why? That's all I said, right? And desperately try to get my phone off to one of our white allies who's also out in the room. And um, I'm arrested, but I didn't think I'd be charged. So the story is, right, that I actually, charges were actually filed against me. 
um, in that arrest. And so I'm now, um, I wasn't worried necessarily about that part because we have it on video, what actually happened. I felt like any jury could see that I did not commit their charge of battery on a police officer, right? Um, <laughs> but they tacked on seven additional counts, not all related to that date, right? And those counts come from our resistance. Those counts include things like saying their names in police commission meetings. So when they ruled that the murder of Carnell Snell, who was 18 years old when they murdered him in his own neighborhood, when they ruled that that was in policy, the only piece of justice we could get is chanting the name Carnell Snell. That apparently is, is a crime, right? Those are the things that have been added on. So I didn't expect to become the subject of my talk. But when we talk about repression, this is what we're facing. And it's not only me. Um, in the last two years, we've had over a dozen organizers be arrested out of this public meeting. Now, what I say often is when white people participate in public meetings, that is called civic engagement. It's something that I study as a political scientist. We talk about civic engagement. We talk about going to city council meetings and going to you know, lobby your representatives. That's called civic engagement. But when black people do it, it's called radical action and it's criminalized, right? And so it's important that we understand what happens um, when we talk about a system that was deliberately set up. Manning Marable has a phenomenal book that um, hopefully everybody's read. It's a classic. It's called How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America, right? And it's really kind of a takeoff. It's a, a focusing in on the US system, but it's um, based on Walter Rodney's work how Europe underdeveloped Africa, right? And so we need to make sure that we understand what Manning Marable is saying. What Marable says is none of these systems were accidentally created. They were intentionally and deliberately designed to produce these outcomes, right? Intentionally and deliberately designed to produce these outcomes. And so we have to understand that racism White supremacy, the more specific term uh, for racism, right, was intentionally embedded in virtually every system in this country, right? And so we have a racist system that was designed to repress especially black dissent, right? Designed to keep us silent, right? But it's important to understand that we've never been silent. And I don't know where, um, the queen mother who was downstairs earlier during, during our community conversation. <laughs> Sister here, thank you so much for raising up that from the moment we were stolen from the shores of Africa, black people have never submitted to our own oppression. We have always refused. We have always resisted, right? Um, Henry Highland Garnett says that it's our duty, right, that, you know, um, he says, let our motto be resistance, resistance, resistance. No oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance, and we've always resisted. And so it's important that we understand that even in this moment, even in this moment where we're, um, and I shared to the group earlier, right, I went to this training about how to make our um, messages resonate with people, and I know we're in Ohio, and most of your state like voted for Trump. <laughs> most of your state voted for Trump. Y'all gotta own that. Y'all got some work to do. Y'all got to. And white folks, let me say this: I know you want to say, "Well, not me." If it wasn't you, it was your cousin, right? The vast majority of white people, and it was only white people who in majority voted for this president. You all voted for him. If it wasn't for you, it was your cousin. Nah, nah. We gotta, we gotta also look at the fact that he has, I mean, he says it and he lies most of the time, but some of the stuff that he says is not a lie. 
that his approval ratings are high, especially among white folks. They are. And look, got to call it for what it is because it means that you have work to do. And let me be real clear, and I'm going to echo you again. Really, you should be uh, making the speech, Mama. Right. You should be making the speech. White folks, this is your work. You got work to do. You got work to do, right? So anyway, I went to this training, and they said that we shouldn't attack Trump because that doesn't resonate with people. We should just talk about our ideas, but I think it's important that we understand the enemy that we face, right? And so I'm just gonna quickly talk about him without giving him all of my time, right? Him and his regime and the whole band of white folks that voted him into office. We gonna talk about all of them, all right? We are living in a time that is the most blatantly racist of my entire lifetime. And I was born in the 1970s, even though I'm 29, so don't let the math fool me. Right? <laughs> you too, you 29 too, yeah. Yeah, my kids always go, what year are you? I just had a birthday. They always go, how old are you this year? Are you 29 again? Yes, again, perpetually, right. Um, but this is the most blatantly racist time of my life, right? Um, we've always seemed to be making our way towards, um, a better society, right? We've always seemed to be making some progress. If you remember just a couple years ago, right, they used to talk about dog whistles. They used to talk about, there's this language around implicit bias, right? And that's the work we need to do. We need to, you know, get white people to kind of understand their own biases, right? Look, and I said it then, but I didn't know how right it would, I would be, right? that it's about much more than implicit bias. It's about explicit racism, right? And that's where we are right now, right? We are in a society that is explicitly racist. I used to call it explicitly patriarchal, but given what's happening with these Kavanaugh um, hearings and the appointment, it's misogynistic. It's beyond just patriarchal, it is um, violent towards women, right? Um, it's heterosexist, it's um, rampantly capitalistic, right? These are all things that we have to look at. And we have to look at this white supremacist, misogynistic, heteronormative, heterosexist, capitalistic society in three ways, right? What Trump has ushered in, right? And I won't say his name three times because that's what they say happens, you know, when you call the devil's name three times. We're not going to say it. So that's two, I think. We won't say it no more, right? <laughs> um, although if he appeared in here, maybe we could all grab him. So <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> my mind is now going places it should not go. <laughs> somebody to just drag him out of office, like just drag him, right? Go to jail, we'll put hella money on your books, right? <laughs> Top ramen and Twinkies forever, right? <laughs> See, if you've been in jail, you know what I'm talking about. That's like the good stuff in jail, right? <laughs> so if we think about how that's manifested, it's manifested in three ways. First, in terms of rhetoric. Right? We can think about the way in which violent white supremacist rhetoric has come out of this office. So what I wanted to talk about in terms of rhetoric um, was something a little different than I think I'm gonna have to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk about the way in which his rhetoric has been used to assault, you know, every black person from Colin Kaepernick to Maxine Waters, right? Um, calling NFL players sons of bees, so not just insulting them, but their mothers, right? Um, I wanted to talk about how even, you know, um, misguided skin folk who ain't necessarily kin folk like Amarosa have been called dogs, right, and dehumanized, right? 
I wanted to talk about that rhetoric, but right now we're on this Kavanaugh thing, so I think I'll kind of just talk about the rhetoric there a little bit, right? I was watching some of the hearing, and the first thing that struck me is that when Kavanaugh got to speak, his name tag says the Honorable in front of it, right? The Honorable for someone who has committed sexual assault on multiple occasions, right? The honorable. So what does that mean in terms of rhetoric, right? What does it mean when Trump gives a, uh oh, that was three times. Watch the door, right? See, you know what? Now you're gonna get me off on something else because because as they're talking about impeachment, I keep thinking, y'all got to do it like Nixon, though. You got to get rid of the vice president first and then get rid of him because Pence is somebody people don't get. He's an easier pill to swallow, but he's smart. And that's like smart evil is worse than dumb evil, right? So anyway, we got to come up with a better plan than just impeaching Trump. Like all of them got to go. We got, we got to drain the swamp, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, in terms of rhetoric, I wanted us to think about how he's been talking about Kavanaugh under this kind of boys will be boys frame. When this is the same person who called for the execution of five actual boys who actually did not commit a crime. Remember that full page ad that he took out against the Central Park Five calling for them to be executed? So black boys don't get to be boys, but grown ass white men get to be boys, right? and get to be excused for their actions. So I want us to think about white supremacy in those terms. I want us to think about white supremacist rhetoric and how harmful it is to us, right? So that's first, right? Next is in terms of policy, right? We need to think about how that rhetoric isn't just a matter of speaking, isn't just a matter of thinking, but it's a matter of real impacts on real people, right? Think about immigration policies. And also think about um, appointments of, of people, right? Including some skin folk, right? Ben Carson, right, who says that um, poor people are responsible for their own uh, poverty, right? How are you gonna be the head of uh, HUD, right, housing and urban development when you think it's our fault that we need housing, right? That's a problem, but I also want us to think about Sessions, right? Sessions actually, now I won't say his name three times. He looks like the devil, doesn't he? Right? Not, or he were elf, right? So maybe, <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, right, who's named after, named after not one, but two Confederate soldiers. Right. <laughs> um, the policies that he's enacted, the way in which he's minimized these consent decrees, the way in which his boss and he have talked about how police should be not holding back their abuse, but ramping up their abuse, the way in which he's empowered police departments to violently go after specifically black, brown, immigrant, communities and poor communities, right? How this rhetoric translates into policy is hugely important, right? So rhetoric, policy, and then thirdly, what we don't always talk about, but what we should know as activists, is that it's not just about what agencies do, what government does, but also about how people feel that they are now permitted to act as a result of these structures, right? So hate crimes, those of you who re research, I research hate crimes, right? Hate crimes have been on a downward trend for at least 40 years, right? They've always dropped, right? In the last two years, we have seen a 44% surge in hate crimes, right? So what's happened with the Trump, 
Trump candidacy and now the Trump presidency is he has empowered violent white supremacists to not only march in places like Charlottesville, but to come into communities like South Los Angeles and East Oakland, right? And feel like they have a right to be there. Now, thankfully, our folks ain't really having it, right? And they were kind of dumb to come to uh, 101st and Central because it's more of us than there are of them. And, you know, the three of them that wind up actually making their way all the way to that intersection um, understood that they were outnumbered <laughs> very quickly. One of them actually started running, right? We literally chased him out the neighborhood, right? But violent white supremacy, right? And when we think about this violence, it's not just about their marches, but um, it's about the actual lives of black people, right? So these surges in hate crimes were only accounting for a small fraction of the violence against black people. Black people continue to be the most targeted by hate crimes, right? When we talk about hate crimes, we're only accounting for a small fraction of the violence because the way that they determine something to be a hate crime is it has to be a hate crime on its face, right? So they have to say, I am assaulting you because you are black, right? They have to, you have to be able to say, they called me the N word and beat me because I was an N, right? Not just that um, in the case of Frederick Taft, the 53-year-old, 57-year-old black man who was at his family reunion in July of this year in Long Beach, California, who was in a park, Pan American Park, that's frequented by the neighborhood and had seen an increase in um, anti-black, racist, white supremacist graffiti in the park, is at his family reunion, goes into the restroom and there's a white supremacist laying in wait for somebody black to go into the bathroom and he shoots Frederick Taft in the black back while he's at the urinal with an AR-15, right? Murdering this father, murdering this longshoreman, mur murdering this community member who's beloved by his community. The white murderer gets away and is still on the loose, is still on the loose. We didn't classify that as a hate crime. We didn't classify the hate crime that was committed against 18-year-old Nia Wilson on the BART platform in Oakland, California, when she was violently stabbed to death, along with her sister who survived the attack by a white supremacist, by a declared white supremacist. That was not classified as a hate crime because he didn't say, I'm stabbing you because you're black, when he did it, right? We didn't classify the murder of Marquise McLaughlin in Clearwater, Florida as a hate crime, right? Marquise McLaughlin, as you remember, it was captured on video, right? Comes to the aid of the mother of his children who is being verbally attacked by a white supremacist who's calling her all kinds of epithet, epithets, right? Um, he comes out of the gas station where he had been paying for his purchase and sees her being attacked and shoves the person out of this face of his partner and is shot to death in that gas station, right? But that's not classified as a hate crime. In fact, the police stand up for the murderer and said he had the right to stand his ground, right? So those aren't classified as hate crimes, but we need to classify them as hate crimes ourselves. So we've seen a 44% surge in, in what's measured as hate crimes, but it's much more than that when we think about violent white supremacy, and that's not even including the things that don't result in death. That's not even included, uh, including the, the fact that in the last semester I have had five in-person attacks on my office at the university. Not five in one semester. Right? We're, We're not, not including those kinds of things. We're, We're not including, including you know, the way in which our children are being called um, the N-word and being told to go back to their countries and being told that they are, you know, my children who are black and Muslim, right? Muslim-ish, right? Being told, <laughs> being told that they're terrorists, right? 
We're not talking about that, but we need to understand what it is. So this era has ushered in white supremacy in terms of rhetoric, in terms of policy. I neglected to mention, you know, when we talk about repression, the black identity extremist report, right? Um, so rhetoric, policy, and violent white supremacy, right? And so many have called this period the Trump era, right? But I want to remind you that we're still in the Black Lives Matter era, right? And so we can't just submit to that. We can't submit to saying, you know, they've won, right? They've become emboldened to do things, right? They've been, become emboldened to attack us more blatantly, to replace the dog whistles with actual trumpets, right? No pun intended or pun intended, right? Um, I thought that was clever. <laughs> um, we can't succumb to that because what, what we, we have, have to remember is what sister, tell me your name again, <laughs> Henrietta. Yeah. Henrietta, I should remember that because my great grandmother is Henrietta Cox. So I will remember that your name is Sister Henrietta. Mama, can I call you Mama Henrietta? Okay, Mama Henrietta. What Mama Henrietta reminds us, black people have never submitted to our own oppression. We have always fought, right? So we fought against chattel slavery, right? We fought against chattel slavery both on the continent when they attempted to steal our people, on the ships that they loaded us up onto, right? So we got to think about, you know, the work of our queen mothers, Queen Nzinga, Ya Asantewa, and others who fought back on the continent against colonialism and enslavement. We have to think about our Four mothers whose names we'll never know who refused to be taken on those ships, who would rather jump off the sides of the ships with their babies in their arms than to become chattel, right? We need to think about what we did in this country, right? We need to think about, you know, what Mama Harriet Tubman did, right? And what Nat Turner did, and what Gabriel Prosser did, and what Denmark Vesey did. We need to think about how they struggled and how they ended chattel slavery, right? I know y'all like to celebrate Abraham Lincoln, right? But Abraham Lincoln didn't free the slaves, right? In fact, he said, if I could save the Union without freeing one slave, I would, right? But guess what we did as black people? and as allies and accomplices of black people, right? We said we will make ourselves ungovernable, right? We will make ourselves ungovernable and you will not be able to keep us as your property any longer and we will win, right? And we won, we toppled chattel slavery. And then when they said, okay, well, you're not our property anymore, we're gonna hang you by trees, right? We're gonna usher in this era of lynching Guess what happened? Mama Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and the black club women, now they try to act like once you achieve middle class status, black people become um, part of the system, but that's not our history, that's not our lineage, right? We use our resources to free our people, right? And so, the, and we gotta remember black middle class is not the same as white middle class, right? Um, but the anti-lynching movement was considered the most radical movement of the time. And Mama Ida B. Wells said a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. She said, if I could, I figured if I could take out, um, if the lynchers, if they came for me, I figured if I could take out one or two of them with me, I'd even up the score a bit, right? That's Mama Ida B. Wells. And guess what happened? We ended that first wave of lynching, right? I know they like to paint Martin Luther King as you know, the mastermind behind the civil rights movement and as the one and he was marching in front of everybody and we followed behind him like he was Gladys Knight and we were the pips, right? But that's not what happened. Ask anybody who was alive at the time, right? Some of y'all in here were alive at the time, right? We remember that the masses of folks stood up. That's why I love the film Selma because it complicates that narrative, right? It says that it, it was about more than King, right? It was about Septima Clark. It was about Mama Ella Baker. It was about um, James Foreman. It was about 
uh, John Lewis, right? It was about a bunch of folks whose names we'll never know, right? And together, thousands and thousands of people ushered in civil rights for our folks. And then in 1965, young black folks in urban centers said, yeah, y'all won voting rights, but guess what? That's not enough because they're still killing our people. They're still abusing our people. And so what we want is not just civil rights, we want black power, right? And so the black power era is ushered in and um, with it, we see things that we still have, right? We see um, uh, uh, black studies. I always say black studies is the most enduring victory of the black power era, right? We're now 50 years, celebrating 50 years of black studies, right? Um, black studies is part of it. When we think about Head Start programs, that was out of community demand. We've always won. So where we are right now in the black power era is just one mark on this long trajectory of black resistance, right? Um, there was a moment in the 80s when the rapist Bill Cosby, and he is a rapist, we gotta call it for what he, what he is, right? I'm not crying that he got some time, right? I wish all the white men who've been raping people forever would also get some, there'd be some justice brought to them, right? It's interesting, he's the only one to go down, right? Right, right. Huh? Right. How many accusers does Trump have? Right. How many victims does Trump have? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Harvey Weinstein and all them others. They, it's interesting. It's only Bill Cosby. But Bill Cosby did a number on us. Right? In the 80s and 90s, he convinced us that the way to black freedom was simply to assimilate to white norms and then we'd be free. We'd be accepted into the American whole if we named our children names like Aaron and Ennis instead of names like Tandiwe, Amar, and Amen, right? Those are my three children, right? Because then they'll know they're black if they turn in their resume and it says Tandiwe Abdullah. Well, you know what, then that means they're racist. Ain't nothing wrong with my daughter's name. My daughter's name means the loving, humble servant of God. Right? And, and so, so I, I believe they, they, that you live up to your name and she is living up to her name. There's something wrong with your, maybe there's something wrong with your child's name. That your child is named after the people who enslaved them, right? But Bill Cosby did a number on us, right? And I'm not trying to attack anybody's name, but remember that was his argument, right? That we just, if we just assimilate, if we just are good Negroes, then we'll be free. Right? Will be accepted by the system. So there was a little period in black history where I would say the majority of black folks were kind of moving towards that assimilation frame. But then we start to wake up, right? Because there's also this countercurrent. I'll, I'll give a lot of credit to hip hop, right? Here. And we started to push back. And in 2013, when they murdered our son, Trayvon Martin, when he's murdered by a fake cop, by a wannabe cop, George Zimmerman wasn't really a cop, and he wasn't even really white, right? But he got white privilege, but his mama is Peruvian, to me that don't make you white, right? But he wants to be white, so he got, they gave him white privilege, right? Our son, Trayvon Martin, 17 years old, is walking home and murdered by George Zimmerman, and the system decides that it is going to give George Zimmerman all of those privileges, and something happens, right? When George Zimmerman gets off, we say, that's too much. And I think it's transgenerational memory. I think it is the voices of our ancestors bubbling up through us. I believe that the spirit of Mama Harriet Tubman is still here. The spirit of Ida B. Wells is still here. The spirit of Ella Baker is still here. The spirit of Huey P. Newton is still here. Of Tupac Shakur is still here, right? And saying, do something. Do something. Get up. Get up. And we heard them. So on 
July 13th, 2013, in almost every major city, we poured out into the streets. In Los Angeles, tens of thousands of us poured onto Crenshaw Boulevard, and for three days, we were out in the streets continuously. And on the third day, I was um, one of a few folks who was contacted by one of the most brilliant visionary sisters I know, Patrice Cullors, who I had been organizing with for maybe five years or so by then. We were part of a black organizers group together. And there was a text message, so there's a moment I like to tell this story that, so I'm a single mom of three kids, right, so we're out in a protest, and I also believe that it's important that we train our children to know that they have power and that they don't have to submit to their own oppression either. Right? So I organized with my kids, right? My babies were on my back or in a stroller, right? As we were organizing, right? And so the third day of protest was the first freeway shutdown of the Black Lives Matter era, right? So I remember the moment we were marching up Crenshaw and I remember who called getting on the freeway. There were these three young boys, right? They were maybe 14, 15 years old and we're marching past the 10 freeway, which is one of the biggest freeways in Los Angeles. And I see them excitedly like looking at each other. And one of them just decides and he rushes on the freeway and the two others follow and the whole mass, thousands of people pour onto the freeway and block traffic like both ways and it was the most beautiful show of power and strength I'd ever seen and my kids my daughter is a mess she's a wonderful mess right my eight-year-old thinks that she is I don't know the second coming of, actually I do know the second coming of Sojourner Truth because her handle is a little Sojourner right so that is who she thinks she is right um, she was born on Sojourner Truth's death date so um, not the actual year, of course, right? <laughs> but the, the date, right? Um, and so she goes, come on, mama, let's get on the freeway. And my kids at the time are eight, five, and two. And I'm like, no, we're not getting on the freeway, right? But what we did do, we were standing there and I took a photo of it that was um, well documented and went viral and everybody could see the shutdown. But as I'm standing on the freeway overpass, I get this text message from a brilliant journalist named Tanda Seesway Chimarenga, who was forwarding a text from Patrice, who I mentioned. And it said, I always imagined that if text could talk, it would have sounded like this. He did not be like it was a message from the Underground Railroad, right? Meet at 9 p.m. at St. Elmo's Village. St. Elmo's Village is a black artist community that's physically built like um, an African village, right? It's a bunch of, uh, uh, what are they called? Like um, cottages that surround a courtyard, right? And so we met there at 9 o'clock that night, and in the middle of the, we met all night, and in the middle of the night, it felt, I'm sure the moon was full. I'm sure it wasn't my imagination, right? We get into the circle and we talk about what it is to build a movement, not a moment, right? A movement, not a moment. And so we committed ourselves to that legacy of black freedom struggle. We committed ourselves to building a movement, not a moment. So even though it seems like our enemy is this gargantuous beast that we can't overcome. We have to remember that we can, that we always have, that we always win, right? I think of the story of David and Goliath and people talk about you're facing a Goliath. Yeah, but who won that fight, right? So it does, so yeah, so I might be the David, but guess what, right? So all I need is a few rocks, right? All I need is a few folks, and we win. We win. There's three things, just like they have three things, we have three things. There's three things that we have to bring to our work. We have to bring our voices, right? We have to think about it. I appreciate what Mari said, although I think we should be in our own rooms, because I think each one of us has a piece of a puzzle that fits together, right? Um, 
Yes. <laughs> and um, I think, though, what you're saying, and tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, is that our voices need to sing in unison, in harmony, right? So just because my work is ending police violence and state terror against black people, right, doesn't mean I have a right to be silent about what's happening at the southern border or that I have a right to be silent about the degradation of our planet, right? I have to use my voice for that purpose too, right? And especially for the white folks in the room, right? Your work is to undo the work of your ancestors. That is your responsibility. It is your responsibility to understand that you created these conditions, right? And it's not to feel guilty about it, but to be rebellious about it, right? So we often in our circles in Black Lives Matter summon our ancestors, and we have this phenomenal group. Um, I have a sibling in spirit that stands next to me all the time, Dahlia Ferlito. She's the co-founder of White People for Black Lives. And um, when we call our ancestors, we always go, well, y'all got at least one. So they've been hashtagging for the last, white people for black lives has been around for four years, right? Every year they hashtag John Brown 2018, John Brown 2017, John Brown, 2017, John Brown right? You have some work to do, right? You have to resist, you have to, undoing white supremacy is more your work than it is ours, right? So that's important, so you have to use your voice. You don't get to sit down and be silent when your racist ass cousin is talking crap at the, at the dinner table, right? You don't get to say, well, we're just gonna get along this holiday. Hell no, flip that table over. Yeah? So use your voice. We need to also use our bodies, right? So we need you to show up, show up. I'm tired of it being black people who are constantly on the lines, right? They treat you different than they treat us. When we're confronting police terrorism, because that's what it is, they treat you differently, right? When I was arrested for battery on an officer, there was a white woman standing next to me, Gina, who says, it was me. I pushed you. I pushed you. Right now, I don't know if she pushed anybody. She says she did. But she wasn't arrested. Right? When we're doing our work, we need you to put your bodies on the line because they treat you differently. Last week, we were in front of DA Jackie Lacey's office. Our district attorney has refused to prosecute a single officer in any of the 400 plus murders that have occurred of our people on her watch in the last five years. More than 400, it's now 420 something people who've been killed in five and a half years in LA County by police. She has refused to prosecute a single officer. So every week for almost a year, we've been demonstrating outside of her office. She's one of these skin folk who ain't kin folk, right? We were out there last week and Dahlia, my sibling in spirit, right, was writing with chalk. Now, she was apprehended. She was held back by the sheriff for what she was doing. But she was never threatened with arrest. She was let go. I've been arrested six times. I guarantee you if it had been me, I would have caught a case, right? And so it's important that we understand that white people, especially, you got to put your bodies on the line. When um, I was just on the phone with Samaria Rice, who's still struggling for justice for Tamir, right? She's not that far from here. It's less than two hours to Cleveland. Yeah. Y'all need to go help this sister, right? When she says we need you to help build the Tamir Rice Foundation, show up. Show up, right? We need you to do that work. I understand somebody said that there's some kind of demonstration happening tomorrow here. I don't know. Next week here. We need you to show up, right? You don't get a self-care day this Saturday, okay?
your, your body. body. And then lastly, we need to put our resources on the line. You don't need another pair of shoes. You don't need Starbucks, right? You can make better coffee at home, right? <laughs> we need your resources. We want to be real clear that real grassroots movements don't get the Soros money that they be talking about, right? So I know it's all over the internet, Black Lives Matter is funded by Soros, right? Let me tell you, if he gave me a billion dollars, I would take that shit. <laughs> we could buy a lot of freedom with a billion dollars, but he ain't giving us no billion dollars, right? And I don't know if everybody would take it, but I, I think that's a good strategic move. A billion dollars can do a lot, right? Um, our movement is funded, grassroots movements are funded when you forego your Starbucks and give us the $5 instead, right? And so we need to show up with our voices, our bodies, and our resources and be willing to put it on the line because there is nothing more important than our freedom, right? And we have to remember that throughout the history of our struggle, when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. I'm going to say it. When we fight, we win. Y'all say it like you mean it. When we fight, we win. When we fight, Thank you for having me.